Hello! Welcome to the podcast, everybody. It's Marshall Ferguson. It's Derek Taylor. He's at DT on SC. I am at TSN underscore Marsh. Get back in the game with Fox 40. Visit fox40shop.com to shop coaching boards, gear, and more. Use the code CFP15 at checkout for 15% off of your order. Thank you, as always, to Fox 40 for making this a reality. And uh, if you happen to see the back of an official, DT, you know sometimes on TSN when they show that view where it's like, you know, oh, it's a short yardage play, and they show the, the down box and the yard that they have to gain, and there's an official standing there, and he's showing whether or not they're on the line of scrimmage properly, and they yeah. zoom in from behind on the back of the collar, Fox 40 logo. That's right. Yeah. So That's- it's soon to be a CFP logo. We'll see. We're, we're in negotiations. <laughs> uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it is great to have Fox 40 along for the ride, as always. So make sure that you are getting all of your gear that you need from them. And, of course, if you want some beer – to be able to enjoy some football down the stretch here, you know where to go. Sawdust City Brewing is the place. Go to their website, sawdustcitybeer.com. And of course, use that promo code CFL. Get yourself some free shipping. As always for us here, uh, the OUA playoffs, they are all set. They are beginning this weekend because the OUA is a larger conference. So they get the extra week, essentially, of playoffs uh, fixtures to be able to enjoy. You can always check out the OUA show and all Canadian here on CFP throughout the week. And uh, you'll be able to get updated on how all of those games are scheduled, shaking out all the rest. I do know there was some confusion as to what the matchups were going to be because the tiebreakers were a little bit weird uh, because McMaster actually ended up beating Waterloo. Mac doesn't make the playoffs. Waterloo does. Mac in the final week of the regular season beats Guelph. Yeah. Mac doesn't make the playoffs. Guelph does. So the, two of the teams that Mac beat, but it's because Mac lost to Western and Windsor and uh, they had another bad lot. Laurier, they got, they got beat up mm. at home by Laurier. So anyways, it was, it was a weird OUA regular season. I mean, Mac, if we were talking about this the other day with Lawrence Hopper, who works at the CFL office, he's a U of T guy. He is like sarcastically over the top Homer, U of T varsity blues, rah, rah, <laughs> because he knows where the program has been. He knows it's been in tough for a long time. And he said to me the other day, he goes, Marsh, do you realize that because there's an OUA East and an OUA West, Max not in the playoffs and U of T is? <laughs> oh my goodness, really? Yeah, because the East is so this. the East is so weak. So you've got U of T playing, and I don't know what all the matchups are. I think that Ottawa is playing at U of T coming up this Saturday, but Queens, I mean, they go undefeated because they played all of their games against York, U of T, uh, Ottawa, Carleton, and in the West, it's like yeah. Murderer's Row. It's Trey Ford at Waterloo. It's Western, who's one of the best teams in the country. It's Laurier being good when they got their quarter- quarterback, Connor Crystal, how healthy. And McMaster, who last time they played, won the Yates Cup. And so Mac got squeezed, man. <laughs> like Mac got squeezed out of the playoffs. And uh, a lot of people have said to me, oh, are you upset about this? I'm like... Not really. I'm not really one of those like super emotional alumni who uh, who feels the need to defend my school, even when there's a down year. I'm like, good years happen, bad years happen. I mean, hell, Calgary's yeah. got two of the best players in the entire country, if not the best players in the, in the country, and their two brother their receivers, they're the Philpots. They're not, I mean, if they are making the playoffs, they're squeaking in with a terrible record because they, they've graduated a lot of players from when they won the Vanier in 2019. So you sports football alive and well, and uh, and we're excited to be a part of that for you out here in Ontario and hope that uh, you can stick around for uh, all the way through the Vanier Cup because we're planning on doing some university shows here on the podcast network all the way throughout those playoffs. Uh, DT was out in Montreal last Saturday night. I was in Toronto for the OT thriller between the Lions and the Argos. Uh, Which delayed my game, by the way, Marshall. (laughs) Delayed my game because Jimmy Camacho... That's all I'm saying. Just because Jimmy Camacho. Yeah, and we will get to Camacho and we'll get to the craziness in Toronto. I do love the idea that people in Saskatchewan or at the CFL office or on TSN are like, all right, Camacho. I mean, this has been a great game. Let's just put this thing to bed. And he missed and it's a single and oh shit, now we're going to overtime. Uh, Because (laughs) that that was the emotion that, because let's be real about this. Like when you work in, in broadcasting, if you're the on-air guy, I don't care. I don't care. What do I care? I don't care. Yeah. Extra, extra football, more stuff to call, great entertaining game. Although I will say this, just once I'd like to, and I, I kind of take this as a personal attack, just once I'd like to have the game of the weekend on TSN that's not the lowest rated game of the four. Just once. <laughs> it's, don't every, take it personally, but every, every game I've done, I'm like, wait a minute. 
are people tuning out because it's they hear me and not Rod Smith? <laughs> um, but I I do think that it's it's interesting the dynamic where you know when I when I get excited because we're going to overtime, I mean that. Like I'm, I'm yelling into the mic, Hey, it's overtime. I can't wait. Let's get it going. There's gotta be people in the truck. that are just like, Oh my God, oh, this screws up everything. And we don't, we don't have graphics prepped and we don't, and I feel bad for them. But in the moment yeah. I'm like with Dunnigan up there, like fist pumping each other and having a great time. And I'm like, yeah, the broadcast industry is like total peaks and valleys depending on the situation. And that's a funny one. Yeah. It's, it's the third time this season I've been like, let's go, <laughs> let's wrap this game up because they stop the clock. The countdown clock starts at like 60 minutes in Montreal. Ticks down and all the way through. Hey, 32 minutes to kick off, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but then it stops dead at five because your game is still going on. <laughs> and then I, I have to – I'm not watching the game, right, because I'm talking to my, my buddy Luke Mullender yep. uh, in the pregame show. And then we, we go to I, – I see what's happening in the game as I go to break. And I'm like, the game is going to be delayed – for ridiculous reasons i will explain when we return and then i have to document what a exactly tease how, oh yeah and i have to i have to spend like 90 seconds documenting and dramatic affecting the entire reason that the insane reason why the saskatchewan rough riders game is delayed on the cooperators rough rider radio network like it's just <laughs> trying to convey that to people was a real real trip hey yeah. this guy can't get out of his own way and there's going to be extra football. I, I do love that. But I also love um, <laughs> that, you know, there's one, one way to fix that, DT. It's, it's to live in the East. Uh, <laughs> fair, <laughs> but, I, but it's like one of those things where the Riders television audience is always going to carry the ratings. Like this year, Winnipeg, when they've been playing on the road, the Winnipeg fans have been crazy. If you've paid attention to the ratings, where Winnipeg is actually challenging Saskatchewan for most passionate television following, which I did not ever think that I would have seen, but Saskatchewan is always going to hold that. And so when we end up yeah. going to overtime for BC Toronto, there's got to be so many Riders fans that are like, we could not care less about what you two little stupid teams out there are doing at BMO in Toronto. Please just kick off our game and get going. But uh, TSN, I guess, doesn't want to start games on different channels because then it's difficult to get the audience to carry over. You feel like you've missed something, even if it's a couple of plays. If you get dropped in and it's a hello to everybody who is watching, you know, the Toronto BC game, it's like, well, what, what did I miss? And you're like, well, you know, nothing's really happened here. But I don't know if you feel this way. I always do when this happens in the NFL. Even if they tell me I haven't missed anything, if it's a game I really want to watch, yeah. if I'm three minutes in, I'm like, well, you might think I've missed nothing, but I might have seen something different than you. Like, I might have missed something that was actually really important to me, especially if I have a prop bet on somebody or, uh, you know, I, I have a, a favorite player who's only going to make one grab the entire game and maybe it was the first play of the game and he's not going to be on camera anymore. So it's, uh, it, again, all of these things are kind of like the funny way that we transition, I think, from game to game. It definitely creates a lot of hurdles. Yeah, it's at least that game, the BC Toronto game meant something to Riders fans. If BC lost and Saskatchewan won, Saskatchewan then clinches yeah. a playoff game. So we got to tell them, hey, BC's lost. So if the Riders win here tonight, boom, playoffs are guaranteed. Nice. And ultimately, that's how it came because of uh, what a weird football game that was. Again, <laughs> the Riders play in a weird football game that the defense needs to force a bunch of turnovers to carry them through. I will say this was kind of funny because I, whenever things are hectic, you know, and you know this as somebody who's been steering the ship on television in different places throughout your career, that you always want to sound as smooth as possible and know where your next step is and your next transition, right? And yeah. so, and I imagine on Sports Center, like that must have been hectic at times because if there were live bullets flying and things all over the place. And so I, um, I said with about two plays to go, you know, in overtime, I think it might have been, been actually after Scarphone's touchdown. I did the, I hit the talk back and I said to my producer, Mark Marshall, where am I going? Where am I going from here? And he says to me, uh, throw it back to the panel. And in my mind, I'm like, huh? I'm like, aren't they waiting in Montreal? I'm like, I, I thought we were just going to go straight there. But he's like, no, because they couldn't start that five minute countdown clock that you're talking about until we were essentially done. So they had to do the quick transition from the panel and back. So a lot of these things are determined by the business of the sport. I think people will be yeah. able to, to appreciate throughout this conversation. But let's talk specifically about that Saskatchewan-Montreal game um, that you were calling. I did not get to watch it like I do most games because it was obviously, you know, I was working for essentially the first half while we were taping video hits and packing up and getting out of there. 
and I ended up watching it back and man, the defenses, like the defense is just, yeah. they, they got after it. They were very, very aggressive. It felt like, and the offensive lines struggled a little bit. And, um, you know, seeing Cody after the way he played against Calgary, where his feet were so quick and his reads were so quick and he seemed so sure of himself and confident and high completion percentage. And then seeing the way he looked at times against Montreal, I, and I saw some of the articles that came out, but yeah, the offensive line struggles and Cody doesn't love the feeling of feeling like he's going to get hit all the time as no quarterback does. Um, but it was just another one of those kind of you know, steps, I think, in the evolution of the riders throughout this season. And I've actually been asked to write a bit of a longer article on the riders offense for CFL.ca this Friday. Um, and that's going to kind of be the theme of the article is, man, there's been a lot of ups and downs. There's been, a lot of different personnel packages used. There's been a lot of bodies in and out because of, of injuries. There's been a lot of different things that Cody's had to go through in his second year as a full-time starter that he probably didn't anticipate when he started the year. So it's, it's an interesting team and you've been there for every moment. Yeah, it, it was going to be, I thought it was going to be a neat game as we walked into it because they just spent a month playing nobody but the Calgary Stampeders, right? Yeah. There was a bye week in the middle and they played three games against the Stamps. And the Stamps in those three games blitzed, I believe it was 16 times in total in wow. more than 100, and, I think it was 114 dropbacks. So that is an incredibly low blitz rate for any level of football outside of like the NFL Pro Bowl, right? So yes. Cody's been getting used to that. So all week long, I was asking him and Dan Clark, you know, what's this transition like? Because Montreal blitzed on 49% of its its downs and almost 60% of the time on second and long. So He's like, well, I'm gonna, Jason Moss told me I'm going to get hit. So he knew going into the game, this team attacks relentlessly. And I haven't seen the final numbers yet, but I don't think Montreal was up to par throughout the, the full 60 minutes in their, in their blitzing and attacking. But it, it clearly had its effect uh, on Fajardo. Uh, man, the team is so interesting because we were, we were liberally praising the defense after the game because, hey, they forced four turnovers. But the defense gives it up and the offense doesn't get it back. It's really, right. they're a really interesting mix right now because we're, we're, we're full of praise uh, because Luchez Purifoy has an amazing interception. What a great read to take one away from, from Jake Winicky. Three turnovers on downs they forced with some tremendous play. The offense all season long hasn't been able to meet it after, after the Toronto game, which is now a whole bunch of, of weeks ago. They, yeah. They can't run the ball through the running back. Protecting Fajardo seems to be more about getting the ball out quickly than actually being able to protect Fajardo with, you know, and I don't want to say just offensive line because there's more that goes into protection than that. There's schemes and there's backs and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's, you leave that game going, a win is a win is a win and it's a playoff spot and boom, let's go. Right. What will it take to win a playoff game though? And do they have it? if they don't win the turnover battle by a zillion as they did in this game. Yeah. And, and I guess my question for you is, do you think that they have the ability against a Calgary who they've struggled at times this season against, or against a Winnipeg who everybody has struggled against for the, all of the season yeah. um, to, to force those turnovers? Because a lot of the time when you're talking about turnovers, it's sometimes you have a quarterback who has an errant throw and you catch it like a punt. But there's a lot of the time, especially in playoff football, where you have to make a great play. Like you yeah. got to come from behind a guy and punch that. And I understand there's no way to answer this because turnovers are very in the moment and random. And But they're going to have to rely on getting good field position against Winnipeg, assuming they get to a West final out there in the peg. They're going to have to get to good field position and they're going to have to do it likely through turnovers and shot plays. And yeah. the, shot, the shot play stuff is not there as of yet. It might develop in the next two, three weeks. I wouldn't bet on it considering what we've seen, but turnovers and turnover creation is an interesting one for the writers because Jason Shiver's not afraid to send some pressure and try to cause some havoc. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a matter of whether or not they get some of the bounces. Like, I don't know, boom, watch him where a ball gets tipped in the air and he's like, Oh, thanks. And just takes it back to the end zone. As I had <laughs> exactly. the DC Toronto game this week, like that's, that's unpredictable, but that's the type of stuff that wins you playoff games. Well, and, and that's going to be the thing, right? Calgary, Calgary is doable. Those were all one score games between the riders and, and stamps and, uh, one score games they're they're random right if you lose a yeah. bunch one year your record's going to improve next year and vice versa so there's a great deal of randomness in those it's the three score games you go okay how do they how do they combat what what winnipeg can do uh just pulling this up because i wanted to wanted to mention this 
Uh, the Riders' defense, which now has 14 interceptions, most in the league, and the turnover ratio is probably top of my head is probably plus 13, plus 14 right now. I'd have to check to be 100% good. Sure. Uh, th- that's that's a fantastic number. Um, they allow 8.8 yards per passing attempt, which is better than only Ottawa. And you go, oh, if mm. not for all these turnovers, what would be happening to this defense? Uh, and then on offense. They average the second fewest yards per attempt passing. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's that's not that's not a recipe for success. If I broke that down into yards per drop back, maybe it changes a little bit because right. then you add in things like their second in sacks on defense and Fajardo scrambling effects, uh, which reminds me of something I have to do tonight because that's <laughs> that'll be good times. But it's it's been it's been about turnovers. I mean, this game, as I look back at this, and this is just narrative based. If Luches Purifoy, I watched that play again this morning. He just takes off from his safety position. He sees Jake Winicky underneath and just takes off. And he read it so well from Matthew Schiltz that he barely even touches Winicky as he runs by him with the interception and he's gone. And in the moment, well, actually after the game, in the moment we were, we were flipping out because that's an incredible play. Right. But after the game, I thought, ooh, if he doesn't take that ball away, I don't know that they win that game. Yeah, and that's fair. Even even with three turnovers forced on downs and not allowing sneaks to get through, and here's Char- Charbel De Beer, the second year guy from Wagner, making a great play on a third and short. Uh, if not for that one play, you go, mm, mm, ee, yikes! <laughs> ooh, ugh. It's it's very, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's un it's not calming. Let's say that. So how do you beat Winnipeg? Winnipeg has to have a bad game. You have to be 4-0 in the turnover battles, which means you are you need to be near perfect or yeah, near perfect. Near, let's say clean. Clean's yep. probably the best way to describe it on offense. And you have to move the ball. And once again, week 13, well, the deep ball will come. Eventually you're gonna <laughs> progress to the mean. But it's still this close to that ball to Kyron Moore. Like, it was in his hands. It was so close. And this close on the one to Shaq. And it's just it's, it's frustrating that it's not there yet. Yeah, no doubt about that. So the, the one thing I did find interesting about this game that you were actually chipping away at just before we hopped on was uh, when you are a coach late in the game, and we'll get to what happened with Ryan Dinwiddie in Toronto, BC. But when you're, a co- when you're a coach late in the game and you've got these decisions to make about special teams and clock management, we had a good example of that in both of our games. So it, it paint yeah. the picture for people and explain what you were looking at when it comes to Montreal, Saskatchewan at that point, I believe 1914. Is that 16, where it was? 1614. Right. Cause that was before the field goal. That was the last score of the game. Right. Yeah. So Trevor Harris comes into the game in the fourth quarter and just starts lighting things on fire. Yeah. Uh, he gets the ball. Montreal gets the ball back with two fifty two to go. And they're for them, unfortunately pinned on their own 18 yard line. The Montreal offense goes 92 yards for the touchdown in a minute 26. You go, oh, okay. That yeah. makes the game 16 to 14. And then Kahari Jones decides to go onside kick with that 126 on the clock. Uh, he goes onside. Uh, Duke Williams grabs it, races down to the 16-yard line. Uh, Montreal's got a timeout. Saskatchewan runs William Powell, loses a yard, timeout. Sack. And then uh, field goal and kickoff. So Montreal gets the ball back with 47 seconds to go. And you unpack all that. And uh, my color guy, Luke Moander, was right on it for the, right at the top. This is a terrible decision by Kahari to go onside here because you have time. You have a timeout and you have time. And if you play out the exact sequence of events, pretend they would have happened exactly the same, which is unfair. But just for the purposes of this, we do it. Uh, running play for minus one timeout sack. Yeah. They would have gotten the ball back about their 45 or 50 yard line with 47 seconds to go. Yeah. And you are bang, bang, bang. The way Harris moved the ball, you might've, you might've scored a touchdown much less David Cote would have had a chance to win it. So we, we wondered if what's your perception you, I mean, you, you watched back through some of the game. What's your perception of onside kick with 126 remaining down two points. Yeah, I because that was a relatively defensive game, like I don't mind the idea that he wants to get the football back and give his team an opportunity sooner rather than later. That that was my first thought was maybe he had a sense for the flow of the game. 
How does it but, get it sooner though? Because well, oh, yeah. off, right? Oh, well, this is the the thing is that if you are uh, going to recover, right, get it back, then that's maybe your play yeah, because you, cause you think that you're going to get it back quicker. Even if they go two and out, you're still costing yourself, even with a timeout, you're still going to cost yourself, you know, 30, 40 seconds. And maybe you believe yeah. that you'd rather take your shot, just get the ball back now, than wait those 40 seconds, hope you get it back, and then get it back on a punt and trust your return team and 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 and. And you also have to factor in at that point in the game that Martise Jackson is down, right? Because he's been dinged yep. by Alberto Wachi earlier in the game. So maybe you don't like your return game as much. And there's a lot of factors, I think, that go into that. With that being said, I, I paid the price this week. And we'll, again, we'll talk about the Dimity stuff in a second of where there's 44 seconds left. And I see what a coach does by going into victory formation. And I just, my brain turned off to the actuality of the situation. And I went, well, he must know something I don't. Like he yeah. must, he must understand the situation. Oh yeah. Kneel it down. Okay, cool. Yeah. It's all good. And I think for me, it's okay to realize that coaches are human and maybe Kahari in that moment didn't do the math, didn't have an analytics guy in his ear, didn't have a sense for, okay, th- this is the way the game's been going Two runs. I have a timeout. I can d- get this. Okay. This will leave me with 45 seconds left on the clock. I should get it around my own 40, 35 yard line. Maybe if we get a stop on a couple of, like, I don't think he did that. I think he just looked at the clock, went end of the game. Uh, okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that that's human. That's human. And that's, that's what we saw from Dinwiddie in Toronto. Um, for me, I, I actually, I'm never really against coaches giving it their best bet. Because if you're going to get a two and out, my thought is always like, try to do that where you go onside, get the two and out anyways, and you have a much longer field, but you're then giving yourself two chances to get the football back versus one. Now that's super easy for me to say, because I'm not a coach. If I were a coach, yeah, and like that's basically you're on the fringe of saying, let's go for two every time. Let's go onside every time. Like those crazy high school coaches in California who are like, let's play the game with three quarterbacks on the field. It's like, you're very close to turning into that person when you get into that mentality. Uh, yeah. But I, I do think that Kahari knows his team better than we do and probably thought that that was his best chance to win because if he didn't I don't think he would have done it like if he knew that that was going to put them in a bad spot uh, or that he didn't feel comfortable with their onside recovery team then he probably wouldn't put them on the field yeah and so so these are kind of the things I, I came to I kind of knew the stats going in but I had to double check and update onside kicks in the CFL recovered a little more than 20 percent of the time so Kahari's weighing that in and going at ah, 20% yeah. time, we get this back. We can still two and out them. And then a touchdown wins it. So that goes in there. And I, I, I tended to agree with Luke that this is too early and it played out exactly the way that you would hope it plays out. You need to stop either way or else you lose the game. So that part doesn't weigh in. As I went back through it, I was just going back through onside kicks uh, in, tw- two, in 2021 and 2019. Uh, Kahari going with 126 is not at all uncommon. Yeah, really. Coaches, um, just as you go through it, 133, 121, 159, 124. uh, That's a two-score game, 143. And we're talking about Craig Dickinson did this one, and uh, Rick Campbell did this one, and Dinwiddie did this one, and Ottawa, and Edmonton. So every coach kind of in that time, I don't know their timeout situations in these games from what I've seen so far. Right. But – what I thought was, oh, this is very early, seems to be the standard for CFL coaches. And I'm, I'm inclined to think that it's the standard for CFL coaches because it's smart as opposed to – there's some things that I'm sure are just group think, and this is the way we always done it. Yeah. But with situations like this, I feel like, okay, there's something else to this that coaches aren't seeing. It's still – it still feels too early because especially situationally, Marsh, like – Stats will sometimes lose the context of what happened. Yeah. Had had, Kahari watched Trevor Harris march (laughs) down the field, hit Jake Winicky on a corner route. Like they were just carving up the riders on the very previous drive. You go, ah, you know what? Give them, give them two and a half minutes of break as your defense gets a two and out and go back and carve them up again. And then you have, you can waste all the time on the clock and, Okay, you're relying on a rookie kicker, which weighs into it. There's all these little things that that make it up, but uh, yeah, it felt it felt strange in the moment. And uh, I, at least I thank Kahari for giving me something else I'm going to need to research <laughs> when I have some downtime on the trip to Edmonton this week because I love I love little puzzles like this. Yeah. What's the best strategy based on your timeouts and based on the time remaining, and then the game situation as well. I love it. 
Yeah, that's all good stuff. And I think, you know, it, I, I love this game for a lot of reasons, but the unique situations that it gives you to me are just king. Like end of the game against, you know, Toronto, BC, I'm standing there in the booth and it kind of struck me as we were kind of coming out of the three minute warning where uh, I, I think I, you know, I kind of got on the microphone to, to the crew and all the camera guys and done again and the producers and the directors and all. I said, all right, everybody, let's go. Let's bring it, bring it home. Let's finish this thing up. Cause I get fired up by the fact I'm like, QB Marsh is yeah, but I, I'm like, we are, we are in the home stretch and we have a badass game. And I said, let's, I said to Dunnigan, I go, there's going to be a couple of big plays here down the stretch. I said, let's friggin. And I didn't say friggin. I said, let's friggin nail the calls. Okay. I said, like, let's, let's get this in and let's do this right. And yeah, it was ex exactly the same way that I was as a quarterback. You walk into the huddle and you start talking people up and getting them going and getting the juices flowing. But I did that yeah. because I knew there's going to be something unique. Like there's yeah. going to be a strange one. And sure enough, there's the inability to understand the clock, mess that up and yell it out when you're not supposed to be kneeling it out. And there's also the fact that ugh, I love the CFL so much for this. You miss a field goal for the win. In the NFL, oh, you tried. Good luck. In the CFL, oh, it's out the back. We keep playing. <laughs> it's like, I love that about the CFL where it's like there's this rule system built in where they go back and forth the whole game. They don't care. Oh, it's a one-point difference, and you just happen to kick it out of the back of the end zone, and we happen to have a rule that gives you a point, and we happen to be going to overtime. I'm like, this is insanity, and I love it every single time. Uh, so I appreciate Rewarding it. failure. Hey, Marsh, you're up for a rewarding failure. But if it gives me more time on <laughs> national television to talk about yes. Canadian, Canadian football, then I'm all for rewarding failure. But um, the, yeah. I spoke a little bit earlier about the fact that I botched that call. I did with, with them 44 seconds left, and I think I got caught up in the moment of – seeing the confidence which with the Argos burst off the sideline and seeing how Dinwiddie uh, very quickly went with the kneel down. But this is the thing I want to just toss out there to people that I find incredible, okay? And this, this really gives you, I think, some insight to coach psychology. Think about the chain of command when they need to make that decision, right? At the end of the game, it could be Chris Jones on the, on the headset, former head coach. He's dealt with situations. It could be somebody in the booth. It could be Stephen McAdoo who's been around a long time. It could be, mm. uh, you know, Dinwiddie himself or Mark Nelson, who's been in the league a long time. They could all be communicating about this stuff and, and trying to figure it out. But I wonder, you know, did Dinwiddie just, say, and he probably has said this in a media scrum. I just haven't had time to review all those things is, did he just, make the decision, send him out there and then realize very quickly, Oh, oops, that was wrong. Because the, the incredible thing is if he takes a knee, how many people that I just mentioned their names on that coaching staff probably looked at the scoreboard, looked at the time went, wait, wait a minute. I don't think this is right. Because then you, you see Rick Campbell running down going timeout. And when yeah. he goes timeout and he's, and I, I kind of realized as I was in the booth and I'm saying, Hey, Argo is undefeated at home. It continues. And they're going to the playoffs. And, and I see Rick Campbell's eyes. That was what told me what was happening because mm -hmm. I saw Rick Campbell was not, <sighs> we lose this. Uh, it was Rick. Cam I'm going, Rick Campbell looks like he knows something I don't know because he's coaching really hard right now and he's studying the clock and he's looking out and trying to figure out who they have on the field. And so they take the kneel on first down and that might be wrong. Rick calls the timeout because he calls that timeout. If you're Toronto, you then have the ability to go, oh man, we messed this up. Yeah. But we still have second down. Like we, we can still, we can still take a, sh not, I'm not saying throw the ball 50 yards, but what I am saying is if you would, <laughs> this is amazing. So <laughs> sorry, I just, I, there's so many thoughts going through my head. Yeah. One of the, one of them is that one time I talked to June Jones when he was in Hamilton about this and he said, coach ego gets in the way of people being able to do what's right because what's daring is often what's right. But people and coaches are too scared to do what's daring. And oh, yeah. so Absolutely. when I, so when I bring that up, I'm, you know, obviously the two points early in the game or the onside kicks or things like that, that all plays into it. But when, when I, I have that quote in my mind from June Jones, because if I'm a coach in that spot and I realize I've messed up first down, that's okay. You got second down, throw it, like throw it, challenge them. Maybe you get a defensive pass interference call on the throw. And if that happens, then, you know, you, you might be able to run out the clock at that point, but you have the ability to still pick it up. You have an offensive play that's at your disposal. I get it. You're backed up in your own end, and but they played it so safe that they should have lost. Like, not only did you mess it up, that's the first sin. The second one is being so conservative and so scared 
not yeah. trusting your own team backed up because, well, if I throw it, they might intercept it and then they have an easy field goal or maybe they pick six it and they go back and we lose the game that way. Or the like, okay, stop thinking about the things that can go wrong and force them to make a play defensively on second down. And if it goes incomplete, what have you cost yourself? 20 seconds? Like, yep. they're going to they're gonna get good field position anyways. Boris Beattie's standing eight yards deep in his own end zone, getting set to punt that thing away because you can't take the single in, or, in order to, or the, you know, you can't, safety, you, can't yeah. ch- you can't change the safety there in field position-wise. So I was amazed that on second down, once I realized what was happening, that they weren't more willing to admit their wrongs. It was almost like Toronto's coaching staff on that second down kind of went like well maybe if we take the knee the second time nobody will notice we shouldn't have done this the first time and then they do it both they do it both times and then the bd standing in his own end zone and i'm like you gotta kick it out i mean <laughs> like yeah because you're not gonna lose the game this way so um yeah it was uh it was amazing to see not only to make the wrong decision but then to double down on it and he never had to apologize for doubling down because I don't think people thought of it that way. He only apologized for, well, I shouldn't have done it in that situation. And it was like yeah. the whole thing was messy and sloppy and it should have cost them. And uh, and it's a lesson that I'm sure will stick with him. I very much doubt that he will ever go into victory formation early to the point where I'm actually wondering next time if he's in that spot, if he accidentally runs an offensive play when he should be kneeling down because he's <laughs> going to be so hesitant to go into kneeling down now. Hey, Marsh, three things can happen when you run the ball. You can gain no yards, you can fumble, or you can gain yards. Only one of them is good when yeah. you run the ball. We need, yeah. to fra- we need to frame it that way because people use that to deride the passing play. But things, bad things can happen when you run the ball. Uh, uh, he forgot the timeout. It's interesting because timeouts aren't as big a thing in the CFL as they are in the NFL, right? In the NFL, the little hash, hashes are on the score bug, and we know exactly, hey, the Chiefs have two timeouts left here. Timeouts are more, are, there are fewer of them and there are different rules for them and blah, blah, blah in the CFL. Right. So that he forgot their timeouts is not really excusable, but not the worst crime ever. But yeah, on, on second down, there's the difference of we can, he honestly probably killed more time off the clock with the kneel down than he would have had they run the ball to John White or Foster or whatever. But you're you have no chance of getting the first down on a kneel down, right? At least if you ran a draw play, you might luck box your way into eleven yards, right? And yeah. then end the game that way. If you throw it, throwing it's a real not. If it's complete, it's it's the same thing. If it's right. incomplete, you've now given uh, BC twenty more seconds to get even closer, and then maybe even uh, Saturday's Jimmy Camacho couldn't have missed that field goal. Camacho with a rough rough day. <laughs> <laughs> rough five minutes in that one um uh, yeah it's it's not but so it, it honestly just this this weekend kind of gave me ammunition for well the coach did it so it must be the right decision well no because these are two of the nine best coaches in all of canada and whether kahari made a mistake or not dinwiddie very blatantly made a mistake right. uh, a, a mistake either in his work process or in his math skills, or or whatever it is. I mean, it's almost certainly in his win pro- in his work process because someone should tell him, "Hey, they've got a timeout, coach," yeah. so he can make the decision. Uh, coaches make mistakes, and it's not just the one decisions. Coaches make mistakes on bigger picture things of should we punt out of our end zone or should we give up the safety? Do we punt in plus territory or go for the field goal? Uh, do we go for it on third and one, which? the NFL revolution of going for it on your final down has not caught on in the CFL. So coaches are not infallible. I, and honestly, Dinwiddie taking full blame for it. Like that was, that was bad. That was great on his part to go. Yes. Yeah. That was, it was obvious to us, but to hear someone in that position who is not, you know, senior veteran, 60 year old, two decade head coach in the CFL. Not like Wally Buono comes out there and goes, yeah, I have that up. No, uh, <laughs> this is a guy who is first season as a, as a head coach. Going, yeah, you know what? I make I made a mistake. It's not on my guys. I made a mistake. I made yeah. it tougher on them than I had to. That's really nice from Din on Dinwiddie's part to go. Yeah, this one's on me because there's a lot of guys I can think of who would have tried to put that somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Or you know, somebody gave me a word in the booth and they never name anybody, and everybody inside the coaching staff actually knows that 
nobody fed him that information. Like there's lots of ways that coaches can try and dodge that bullet, but for him yeah. to bite it, I think was, uh, was, was interesting. And I think that showed well on him. And I, th I hope people respect him for it as much as certain media members do that understand kind of the challenges that he's up against, but Hey, it worked out in the end. McLeod Bethel Thompson completes a pass to himself. And, uh, and then the BC lions, <laughs> <laughs> the BC lions run just an atrocious concept on their two point conversion. Uh, which we didn't really have the opportunity. I felt bad for Dunnigan in this, just to peel back the curtain, because the second yeah. that the game ends and we don't get a chance to really analyze it all that much because we hadn't really seen it. And then I throw it back to the panel and it's time for Montreal, Saskatchewan. And immediately I said, Mike, I need you to bring up the all 24 for Dunnigan and I to look at on that two point conversion. And he does up on our monitors and we look at it. And Maddie immediately, like just football savant, right? Like I, I get it. He's been through a lot of injuries and concussions and he's older and he's a, that dude is sharp as can be when he sees a formation alignment, all these, he knows his stuff. And so he immediately goes, okay, safety's rolling over the top. Creston Butler went there. They had Brian Burnham to the backside and he was running this kind of like lazy slant. I think he knew he was dead to the play because he had the safety rolling over the top. Lucky Whitehead runs this little bang route, little half-hearted, doesn't really get out of his break all that well. Front side, they got two on two. They go switch motion. They've got no free safety in the picture because Butler's left. The will linebacker blitz. Like he immediately just goes bing, 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 bing. And then I just said to him, what do you think of the concept? And he's like, oh, not good. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like he, he diagnosed the whole thing. And then I said, yeah, but what do you, like is, is that, if you're a coach, and this is not a shot at Jordan McSimmick, who knows a hell of a lot more about offensive football than I do and ever will. Mm -hmm. But if you're a coach, is that the concept that you're calling on your go-to gotta have it two-point conversion because my perspective on this is that at McMaster when I was playing Steph Patasic was there great offensive mind John B he was my offensive coordinator great offensive mind and their whole thing was we will always have a two-point ready list that's about five deep and nice. they would always say we only need five of them probably for the full year but you need to let us know like sometimes I come to the sideline in two-point situations the rare two-point situation and they would just say, what's your favorite? What's the one you love? Like, what's the one that you trust the most? And for us, it was very often cluster concepts to the field. So we would have three receivers to the field. Or sometimes we had one really sneaky one that was amazing. And I'm probably going to botch remembering this. But just to give you a sense for the, the variety that's available to teams in the CFL with, with the motion rules that we have to create confusion on a two-point conversion. Because what BC, what BC did was Brian Burnham took two skips football towards the football and then ran a lazy slant. Lucky Whitehead was not given the gift of a waggle. You put two of your lesser receivers to the field. You put two of your better receivers into the boundary together where they were able to get locked down and they have less room to operate. So they didn't really do anything creatively, but we had this one motion at Mac that I love so much where we would actually start uh, the, the run... <laughs> I, like I said, I'm going to botch this because it's been forever since I've thought about this play. But I just remember when I was in university, I've been playing football for a decade, and they presented this play to us before a homecoming game against Waterloo. And I went, what? That's, that's a thing? Like, how was... and, and the motion was, well, we're going to start with one of our receivers lined up in the backfield. Okay. And we are going to start with a running back lined up as our boundary slot. We're going to motion him at the very last second across the formation to the field, we're going to show that we're going to end up having a receiver come from the field into the boundary to replace that running back that's just gone to the field side. Mm -hmm. And instead, what we're going to do is stop motion, fly him back to the flats, and at the very last second, when their will linebacker's confused, we're going to fly our fastest receiver, who's lined up as the running back, to the flats, back into the short side, and we're going to run a cluster where the boundary-wide receiver is going to pick him. And, I, and it was like the easiest concept I've ever seen because now you've got a will linebacker who's confused. You've got three receivers in different motion. You've got people playing out of position offensively and he has to run through traffic. So I think of that and then I see BC where they're like, I don't know, let's just line up like two by two, skip some guys to the line and hope we beat them with our routes. It's like, yeah. man, the CFL and, and Canadian football lets you do some fun stuff. Why BC would not access that when they needed it is beyond me. Yeah, that was that was the one that kind of ended their season, right? Like there's they have the tiniest chance of yeah. making a crossover now, like tiny, tiny, tiny chance of a crossover now. If you ever wanted it, 
you ever had the play that you were you had in your pocket? There has to be a better play than that, is what I'm saying. Like, I, yeah. I, Jordan McSimmick knows too much about offensive football in the CFL. Michael Riley's been around long enough. There's no way that they sat down in meetings and they're like, all right, let's put together our two point ready list. What do you want to do? I don't know, two by two and just like run a switch and try to get to the corner. And if it doesn't work, I just throw it to the empty space. It's like, eh, that's not yeah. how that's supposed to go. So, uh, uh, in terms of the playoff picture, by the way, this is actually kind of amazing. Do you think that Edmonton knows that they're still in the hunt for the playoffs? <laughs> no, I really don't think. I don't think they, they know they either. Are, but they, when you play three games in seven days, you're not anymore. Because you're, not, I, I you're agree. not sweeping that little that road trip. <laughs> well, the funny thing is that yesterday, Steve Daniel, I was talking to him, the great stats man from the CFL, and he was like, Edmonton can get into the playoffs, but essentially they have to win out. And the funny thing is that um, that BC has to get involved and basically play spoiler on behalf of Edmonton a couple of times yeah. because Edmonton has more success this year against BC than other teams. So down the rung of playoff tiebreakers, that would actually help Edmonton's chances to get in. And I'm yeah. like, I'm like, this is kind of funny though because the body language you see on the sidelines and the way that we're discussing Edmonton, it's like, yeah, we've got like four games left against you know two against Saskatchewan, and then we got the the two games at the end of the year jammed in together with Toronto in the makeup game. It's like, do you think anybody from Edmonton is aware? Like, do you think that Brock Sunderland's walked into the room and been like, guys, we can make the playoffs. Like, we can get into this dance because it would, and I know it's not going to happen, but just let me paint the hypothetical for you how hilarious this would be. Edmonton gets into the playoffs somehow with Calgary getting dropped off. Edmonton plays Nick Arbuckle. They strike magic. They strike gold. Arbuckle leads them on a on a chance to go into Winnipeg to play in a West final and out of nowhere. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it would it would be the most improbable dumb thing ever, and it's not going to happen. But it's just fun to think about that in the CFL nine team league. We're this late in the year. They've been talked about for over two months. It's just like ugh, the Elks. They're so bad this year. It's like nope, they're in the playoff hunt. <laughs> like I love that <laughs> in the graphic that always comes up in the NFL is well, here's the division leaders. Here's the wild card, and here's in the hunt. In the CFL, every single team outside of Ottawa is in the hunt with under a month to go. I, I can just picture the Disney trailer of this plucky team of manufacturers <laughs> thought their season was over, but all of a sudden, not weighed down by Moderna or Pfizer, they bust through. Yeah. What, what a validation that would be for the people of Alberta who don't like vaccination to see their anti-vax team get to... <laughs> go on a magical run they'd be like oh, see we're both in trouble <laughs> they, <laughs> I, we're joking obviously but they would they would yes. just be looking around going see we were right the whole time it's like this does not prove that you were right about anything this is just a football team winning some games <laughs> yeah which as a, as a man who puts significant funds on the elks to win a lot of football games this year I've been very disappointed. Even I've come around to the fact that they will not get to five <laughs> on the season. That's so. fair. Uh, let's look at the, uh, the updated playoff scenarios here before we just take a look ahead yeah, at week, week number 14. Um, so the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have some company in the postseason uh, at the conclusion of week 13's games. The Argos, the Riders have clinched playoff spots. The Argos uh, on to uh, win against uh, BC in overtime. They get themselves in the spot. Uh, in the playoff picture, obviously, Winnipeg has secured a playoff spot for the fifth consecutive season in Week 11, way, way back. Uh, and now we get an opportunity to look ahead at what's coming up, and it is uh, Hamilton with a win or a tie. They can get themselves into a playoff spot coming up this weekend. And, uh, and there's another team, I believe, as well, um, that I don't have in front of me. Oh, yeah, it's the Alouettes um, that are also able to clinch themselves uh, a ticket to the postseason here coming up. So anyways, there yeah. you go. That's uh, basically Montreal win or a BC loss. Montreal clinches a playoff spot because that eliminates the crossover stuff. And then uh, for Hamilton, they win or tie and they clinch themselves a play. I think Hamilton has a, actually a clearer road at this point to hosting the East final than Toronto does, in my opinion. Oh, um, Toronto's schedule is tough. Yeah, which might be unpopular down the stretch and might be incorrect, but Hamilton's playing at a, at a pretty good clip right now. So let's look at these four games coming up this weekend. It begins, I've uh, got my final TV call of the year, which I'm excited for. It's BC Hamilton this weekend. Pick a team, DT. Give me something to look for. Jeremiah Masoli, can his interception-free run continue? Uh, for the th first three games of this little run, it was like something like 94 passes, no picks, and or 98, no picks. And none of them were even interceptable. Yeah. Like they weren't dropped interceptions. There wasn't receiver prevented ones. He's been on fire. And based on how terrible he was at the start of the season, it's, it's remarkable to see the transition with that injury and whatever break in between. So uh, if Masoli keeps firing, Hamilton is the favorite in the East. Easy.
Yeah, for me, BC, in terms of their offense, Lucky Whitehead, it was weird, that game in Toronto. And I know you were getting ready for the Saskatchewan-Montreal game, but they yeah. targeted him basically on deep shots. The one time he caught an underneath pass, he looked like he was having difficulty grasping or switching hands with the football. If he's not right, they don't have a chance whatsoever. But I, I just want to see how they use him, how often they target him going into this one. Uh, Saskatchewan-Edmonton, I'm going to force you to take Edmonton. What do you find interesting about Edmonton on the Friday night cap? When does Nick Airbuckle or Elk Buckle or Arbuck Elk get into the lineup? Because Taylor Cornelius is not it. Just yeah. we're we're done with Taylor Cornelius for 2021. Maybe a training camp and 2022 uh, will will help him. But we we got to be done with Cornelius for 2021. When does Elk Buckle get in there? I'm with you on that. I'm excited. It was it's kind of crazy seeing Trevor Harris wearing Montreal blue this past weekend. I was I had to like shake my head a couple times and be like, hey, whew, that, that looks weird. And then I saw Arbuckle wearing the Elks gear, ripping it around at practice the other day in a clip they sent out. I'm like, all right, yeah, this is a crazy year again. But um, for me, Saskatchewan, I just want to see Duke Williams more involved. Like I understand they're starting yeah. to get him into the mix there, but it feels like, especially with Kieran being pretty dinged up at this point, I, I really do think that they're going to have to start leaning on him significantly. I mean, Reggie Bagleton is back, if you haven't even talked about, in Calgary. Nice. And to me, it's just like, this is where the guys that you've brought back in from the NFL need to really start showing that they are special, that they are playmakers. And Duke's got to be that guy for Saskatchewan's offense. So, um, And I'm not asking for him to have uh, seven catches for 300 yards and four touchdowns. What I am asking is, what does it look like when you get more involved? Like, how, how do you get more involved? How do they want to use you? I think those things are all fair questions to ask. And, uh, and we'll see on Friday night in the game. The DT will be calling on 620 CKRM. Toronto at Ottawa, Saturday afternoon. What do you got? Particularly self-serving. If Ottawa loses one of these final two games, my Ottawa under three and a half wins prediction comes true. So uh, that's all I want. Let's throw Caleb Evans back out there for some more good times because, <laughs> uh, yeah, I... On Toronto's side, I want to know what Toronto is because I have no idea. Apart from Sean Oakman ripping people in half, I don't know what Toronto is. You didn't play very much in this past game against BC, which was weird. There was a lot of Samuel Achimpong getting a run there, and, and congratulations to him. He got his first career sack, which was great to mm. see for a young Canadian who was a territorial draft selection. But um, for me, Toronto, I would love if McLeod Bethel Thompson would actually, you know, start hitting some of the double moves. Like, they ran <laughs> so many. Their offense, essentially, in this game against BC was slants, slant and goes, RPOs, inside zone. It was like four plays that they were running, and when they would run the slant and goes, the success rate was not high, even though receivers were open, like they're just killing people. Mm. And they've designed an offense where they make you have to honor the slant over and over and over. And the second you start driving on it, whoop, you're gone. But that's fine. If you're gone, you got to make the throw. So I was waiting on him to make a couple of those throws. And we'll see whether or not he does this week. Because for everything that, that Ottawa does and they struggle with, that game that I called of Ottawa against Hamilton, as soon as you get inside the 30-yard line, Mike Benavides is like, I don't know, guys, just play man. Like, he's basically just like, everybody, man for yourself. Let's see who has coverage skills, because this season's going nowhere. And so if you get a lot of man down there, if you're Toronto and you get inside the score zone and it's man all over the place, you can run your crossers and your man beaters and your pick plays in. But I want to see you against a DB beat them yeah. with a move, and then McLeod's got to make some throws, because it's not going to get any easier than Ottawa late in the season. And so I'm excited to see that. Montreal at Winnipeg. Uh, Montreal, as we say, can get themselves... Uh, into the playoffs with a win or a BC loss. Uh, but at Winnipeg, tough place to play. What do you got? Trevor Harris time. The way he yeah. came on in the fourth quarter of that game against Saskatchewan, uh, he clearly knew enough to march them 92 yards down the field in a minute 26. He was making calls at the line. He showed unbelievable scrambling in that game. Uh, it's Trevor Harris time because it's as much prep as you can get for a playoff run and with potentially a deep playoff run. And if Trevor Harris plays... I'm not sure Winnipeg should be a 12 and a half point favorite. They should still be a real favorite, but 12 and a half starts to look pretty good if Trevor Harris is going to be under center. Yeah, I'll leave it with that. DT knows as well as anybody that Trevor Harris, in terms of the numbers, is probably the guy. Uh, just another thing I got wrong, by the way, from the uh, Toronto BC broadcast is we say, coming up next, uh, Montreal, Saskatchewan. And uh, I said, Matt Dunnigan, what do you see in this one? I said, oh, I, I see great running backs, you know, William Powell and back and forth. And, and then uh, he said, well, how about you? And he goes, what do you see? And I go, I don't know. I mean, Matthew Schultz ain't given up that starting job yet. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> I think Schultz I'm with was you. banged up. So I wonder how much that went into Harris coming in in the fourth quarter. Yeah. But 
when Schiltz played the final play of the third quarter and then Harris was out there on the same drive for the first play of the fourth quarter, I wonder if that wasn't I haven't seen anything, but I wonder if that wasn't predetermined. Yeah, that's fair. He is at DT on SC. I'm Marshall Ferguson. We are the breakdown right here on Canadian Football Perspective. Thank you, as always, for listening. Make sure you give DT a follow. Make sure you check him out coming up on Friday night live from the Brickfield at Commonwealth Stadium. As it'll be the uh, Saskatchewan Rough Riders and the Edmonton Elks. Looking forward to the call of that one, as always. Uh, don't forget to follow along with our good friends at Fox 40 and, of course, Sawdust City Brewing. Thanks to them for making this possible. And we will talk to you coming up next week when we are going to be doing our award nominations reveal. Yes, yes. we're going to be looking at uh, who we think is worthy this year in the 2021 Super Wacky, Super Strange CFL season. So look forward to that next week. But for now, have yourselves a great week and get out there and enjoy the games here in week number 14.